Welcome to the Positive Impact Podcast, where we dive into the world of movers, shakers, and change makers, creating a positive impact on the world. This is your host, Alexandra Black Pollock, and together we're going to tackle real issues, discovering how we can make the world a better place. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Tired of the grocery store? Looking to spice up dinners? HelloFresh delivers delicious ingredients and easy recipes straight to your door. Take $40 off your first box at positiveimpactpodcast.com slash fresh. You'll be enjoying cooking again in no time. All right, movers and shakers, we have a fun episode in store today. Coming from a family absolutely obsessed with food, I always get excited when I get to talk to someone about food on the show. And today we're going to be diving into the superfood acai and environmental sustainability with Evan Delahanty, founder, Peaceful Fruits. Evan was formerly a cog in the corporate world, turned Peace Corps volunteer, and now championing a social enterprise in the health food industry. Evan, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here, Alex. Thanks for having me on. So this isn't actually the first time we connected. We had a pretty incredible session at Journey to Social Entrepreneurship as well. I I mean, explosive, dynamic, hyperventilating. It was great. Yeah, you know, you were eating snacks during the whole time. That might have fed to the whole hyperventilating thing. It was, it was, you know, we were we were going a mile a minute, but I think people got some good stuff out of it, and that's what matters. Yeah. So if you haven't checked out that recording, head on over to journey to social entrepreneurship dot com slash live, and that's our free gift to you, right? Because you know we just can't have all that fun to ourselves. Absolutely. All right. So in your intro, we talked a little bit about how you went from the corporate world, turned Peace Corps volunteer, and now you're leading a social enterprise. What was it that drove you to leave a pretty steady corporate job? I mean, I'm sure you guys had health insurance, retirement, steady paycheck. Why leave? Uh, yeah, we, we did have all of those things, and uh, it was pretty awesome. You know, being a, being a paid and productive member of society, vacations, having work ever stop, those are pretty cool things. But uh, honestly, it just, what got to me was that you know, I was, as you mentioned, a, a cog almost literally because I worked for a uh, industrial supply company. So did my you guys job make was cl- cogs? B- basically, I mean, we we actually uh, just were a distributor, so we distributed four hundred ninety-five thousand different things. Got it. Um, yeah. So uh, basically, my job, in one one sense or another, broadly speaking, was to make sure screws moved around the warehouse efficiently and you know got on and off of trucks. Um, and that, you know, while being exciting because I, uh, you know, I, I was, a, I, by the time I was 25, I had 20 people working for me. You know, I had a, a million dollar budget, you know, guys on forklifts, non-ironically called me boss, which is kind of fun, but kind of terrifying. Um, and uh, so that was great because I got to have a very large impact on uh, on my operations. So you get a lot, of, I got had a lot of freedom and a lot of ownership in terms of, you know, making the, the business run well and run according to my vision. But after doing that for a couple of years and, you know, climbing up the chain, what, what I quickly realized is that, and this is funny actually, because I literally remember saying in the interview with that company that what excited me is about the way that people work, the way that processes work and how you can, you know, move a team both uh, emotionally and also, you know, from an operations standpoint to put it back together in a better way. And I didn't really care at that time about what that team was doing. I just cared about the people in the process. I literally remember saying that in the interview. And then after doing it for three or four years, I realized, hey, you know what? It, it kind of does matter what you're doing in terms of keeping my energy there and keeping, you know, making it something that I was excited to go and do every day. And um, so what I realized is that I was, you know, having, there was a great opportunity to have a on a tiny, tiny, meaningless thing, which was how efficiently screws move around a warehouse. Literally, there was this one number. It had to be close to 14. And if it was too high or too low above 14, then Evan, bad job today. Uh, That was my job. Um, Wow. So I can imagine that that doesn't sound super fulfilling, especially the way you describe it. No, it it wasn't. And I mean, it was fulfilling as uh, in the sense of, you know, they pay a very good wage. They take care of their people. And they really value being a good boss, which was a, a skill that I had the the um, the honor really to to learn. There was how to be a good boss of people, which is just so important. Um, and that part was fulfilling. But but like you said, 
you know, moving screws around a warehouse just, just doesn't, doesn't get you excited in the morning. And so what I decided is that, all right, here I've had this chance to have a huge impact on a very tiny, meaningless thing. So let's, let's just, let's, let's flip flop the script here and, uh, do the opposite. So let's have a tiny, tiny impact on one of the most important things out there, which is helping improve the standard of living for people around the world. I love that you kind of positioned it as a flip flop because it's exactly what you did with your career. And also moving into the Peace Corps after you've been in a traditional role is also a little bit of a flip flop of that traditional career path. So let's transition to the Amazon because I imagine that was a huge transition from a warehouse to go into a completely rural area, like we mentioned in the rainforest. I think I got more mosquito bites in that warehouse than I did in my in my hut in the in the Amazon. Actually, really, like you never know. Man, I remember one day there was I sat right below the uh, the air intake fan in that warehouse, so the mosquitoes would just get sucked right in. Oh. I killed three with one strike once. That's how that's how cool I am. Yep. We'll talk about you know killing perceptions and not just mosquitoes. <laughs> I would have never thought that you would have gotten more in the warehouse. So what was it like in your rural community that you got placed in? Uh, so I was in a, a little village called Pekin Slay, um, which is actually the second largest village in the interior of a tiny little country called Suriname. It used to be called Dutch Guyana. And Suriname is right there on the northeast coast of South America, just above Brazil. Um, and I was pretty much smack dab in the middle of it, um, about 200 kilometers or so uh, south of the coast. You had to take a, a, a drive along a road that increasingly became not dirt as I was there, and then get in a canoe and uh, push your way up the river, not paddle. Fortunately, it was motorized for about two hours, and then you get to my village really just smack dab in the middle of the virgin Amazon. And uh, as I said, remarkably, the mosquitoes weren't too bad out in the village. They were actually way worse in the um, in the in the city. But uh, but yeah, this is a pretty rural and remote area. So they do have a generator that runs, um, you know, maybe a couple hours a day if you're lucky. Um, there is running water because the river is right there, so that runs right by. Um, but no uh, no clean drinking water, no toilets, uh, no reliable electricity. Um, and this is a village just to give the, yeah, it's about 2,000 people, um, which made it the second largest village in, in the interior, as I was saying. Um, and I was the only American and the only foreigner that was living there full time. So also the only, you know, English speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so what language did you get to learn while you were there? So I learned a, uh, a Creole or Pidgin language, you know, however you want to refer to it, but it's a mix of um, a Ghanese dialect because the people that I was living with were uh, originally enslaved in Ghana and then brought over by the Dutch. Um, so their their culture is rooted in West Africa there, and so is their language, but then it's heavily influenced by Portuguese, Dutch, even English and Spanish. Uh, so it's called Saramakan, and that's the name of the, the tribe of people that I lived with was the Saramakan Maroons. I love that you brought up such a unique culture aspect because one of the things I was reading about your experience there is that you described a very different type of culture where they're very tied to their roots, that they're going to wear the kosu, which is your wrap skirt, your kamisa, which is actually a loincloth there. But yet at the same time, they enjoy the modern amenities where they're going to tuck a cell phone. I'm not quite sure where, but it was that, that was really always blended. the question. Right, right. I actually got to see that you wore one of those wrap skirts. So... Um, I'm sure you had a lot of fun trying to figure out where your cell phone went in that. Yeah, you actually, you end up with a very similar to the, uh, the kilt approach. I, I can't remember what it's called, um, but you know, the, the, uh, the, the badger like thing that hangs at the front of a kilt, it's a little like purse. They, they, they do something similar, but they wear it around their neck. But, uh, yeah, you just, you know, find a, find a pouch and place to stick it and it works out, but, but it's a problem. It's a problem, you know, <laughs> ha hashtag third world problems. Opportunity for solution. Let's, you know, we'll reframe yeah, hey, that. Yeah, there it is. So your Peace Corps volunteer position was actually focused on literacy and especially computer literacy, which enabled a lot of the different individuals to move out of that community and more successfully into some of the more populated areas. But yet what's interesting is that your company, Peaceful Fruits, actually focuses on maintaining jobs and opportunities in these rural areas. So after working so long to help individuals have the ability to leave, why the shift? I was a community development volunteer. 
And in Peace Corps, the overall philosophy is that you are there to help with what they want help with, which personally I think is a great philosophy of, you know, people have to ask for help and be ready to receive it before it'll do any good. Um, and so a, a large part of what the people in the village wanted was, uh, you know, a youth program focused on English and computer literacy um, and then similar things for adults. You know, I also did a lot of, you know, small business entrepreneurship support. But ultimately, you know, they had things that they wanted help with. And that was my role was to, was to help them. But as you're as you're going through that process, you see that those um, those skills, as you kind of alluded to, are only good for helping people get out. Um, and what that means is that the people that don't want to get out or the people that uh, don't necessarily want to completely abandon their way of life, those skills aren't always relevant to them. And when you extrapolate that out a little bit, you have some of the very smart you know, kids. For example, I had a, a little kid in the village named Samurai. Great name. One of my favorite kids. Uh, and uh, you know, his dad was a farmer. His dad, you know, before his grandfather had been a farmer and he wanted to be a farmer just like his dad. So he was one of the smartest kids I knew in that village. But he, got, you know, was terrible in school because he didn't care because I don't need to know this. I want to be a farmer like my dad. I want to wear a kamisa and a kosu and I want to be a traditional Saramakan, uh, you know, tribal man. And that's great. And that, you know, and I think we should be supportive of that without pushing people to, uh, learn skills that only work outside of that environment. But at the same time, Samurai, even as a, as a nine-year-old, was smart enough to know, I can't live without cash in this, you know, in this modern world. You, know, you, you do need to have a cell phone. You do need to have the ability to pay for school if your kids don't want to follow your path or to pay for medicine if someone gets sick. And so those, even those traditional farmers need a way to access the outside world on their own terms. And there's lots and lots of... Uh, opportunities for how to, how, how can they, they can get out, you know, how they can get cheap computers or learn English or move to the city or whatever it might be. And actually that brain drain is a big problem, but there just aren't that many opportunities for the people that want to maintain their culture and their way of life and stay in balance with the rainforest. Um, there aren't as many opportunities for helping them do that and then main, maintain or, and then gain control of their, uh, of their own economic development process. And so that's, that gap is something I saw over and over again while I was there for, for Peace Corps. And so I wanted to try to solve that um, when I came back. So how does Peaceful Fruits really kind of plug into this issue and start to bridge gaps and create opportunities? Sure. So the main ingredient in acai, in, excuse me, in Peaceful Fruits, that I just hinted at it, right, is acai. So that's our, our, our snacks. We make a premium fruit snack. So it's like a fruit roll up, but it's just made from 100% organic fruit. And the main fruit that goes in there is the acai, which is, it's actually called potasiri in the local language, which I think is actually more fun. Potasiri. Uh, potasiri. I right? wouldn't be able to spell that though. Like I might struggle with the pronunciation of acai, but at least I can spell it. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, but yeah, so, so the acai, uh, as it's known in the Portuguese, um, the, yeah, the acai is, uh, something that just grows wild down there. And it's, you know, not exactly a delicacy, but it's something that is definitely a treat. It's definitely a, uh, a delicious food that when you know that your the acai trees on your land or your friend's land are going to be ripe, that, you know, you'll take a long detour to uh, make sure that you're there underneath that tree to pick up a lot of the berries to bring home with you. Um, and it is also, when they are in season, it can be a great... Uh, source of energy for folks. It's because acai is very rich in uh, healthy fats. It's actually a very sustaining food, unlike, you know, mangoes, which are also, everyone loves mangoes, and you'll detour a long way to collect, you know, mangoes falling off the mango tree. But that's that's more like candy down there, whereas acai is sort of the, uh, the cliff bar, if you will. Like, it's a treat, but it'll also sustain you through the day. It's super rich in antioxidants and omegas. I mean, it is. It's one of our new superfoods. It is absolutely, and uh, honestly, as a as a I don't know if I should be saying this as a food entrepreneur focused on the acai superfood, but to me, as a you know as a responsible adult and you know someone who tries to take a very rigorous look at these things, the word superfood is definitely overused in our society. Very much so. And, 
And, uh, you know, acai is a great source of everything you just said. It's a great source of healthy fats. It's a great source of antioxidants in particular. Um, but is it going to, you know, cure all your pimples, help you lose 20 pounds and, uh, you know, whatever else? No, it's not a silver bullet fountain of youth magical thing. It's a very healthy fruit from the Amazon. But to me, what makes it such as really a true superfood, and this ties back to your question, is the opportunity that it creates for the people down there. Because the best acai, here's a surprise, is the stuff that grows natural, wild, organic without having to do anything for it, out there in the wilderness, in the jungle, in the rainforest, by itself on these tribal lands. Total shocker. The stuff that Total grows shocker, naturally right? on its own is organic and better for you? Right, not GMO. <laughs> but uh, right, exactly. So, and because of that, and that that is a, a recognized thing in the market, a recognized fact, and so it also commands a premium price. And what that means is here you have a resource that, in some ways, you know, obviously you can exploit the system, but it has to a degree a self limiting factor where it's worth more because it's wild. It's worth more because it comes from unspoiled land. And so when you have people that you know need an opportunity for, to generate some income but aren't looking to totally change their way of life and, and are looking for an excuse to keep people from coming in and taking over that jungle and clear-cutting it or mining it or whatever it might be, this, this type of wild fruit is a great opportunity because it gives them a way to, to, to generate income without having to drastically change their way of life or the way they interact with that unspoiled rainforest land. When you first described you getting to this community, it definitely seemed very challenging to get to. You had to take a road. It was sometimes a dirt road and then eventually over time became a regular road. And it was now, you know, you had to motor canoe in. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or how challenging is it for this, you know, these different groups to find buyers for this product that's literally in the middle of the rainforest? Well, it's, it's tough. Um, it, it is tough. And that's part of what we're trying to do uh, is to be part of the poll for that because the more people that are using that wild acai and of course the more people that we can educate through podcasts like this about the uh, the importance of why wild acai is better and why acai in general can be really a true superfood in several different meanings of the word um, that helps create that market for it that uh, that makes it easier but I'll be honest um, right now we are not getting acai from Peak and Slay, from the village where I lived, because the logistics are, are too hard. Um, they're, they're too deep in there, and this opportunity is not yet something that I can, I can offer directly to the people that I work with. We do work with um, a, a different tribe, a couple, you know, a couple regions over, that has a little bit easier access. You know, it's just a, just a canoe trip instead of a canoe trip plus, to, plus a truck ride. But, um, but absolutely, the better that this system of logistics gets set up and the more that there's awareness about why wild acai is so special, the easier that gets. And so that's our long-term goal is to help expand that program and that you know co-op of, of local communities that, that currently contribute the wild acai that we get to expand directly to the people that I work with. But honestly, we're not there yet. Obviously, as demand grows, you're going to have more pressure to create those infrastructures and get the food out. And there's going to be more sustainable opportunities for the individuals in your original community to both harvest and then sell that fruit. Absolutely. And, and that is also some, one of the things that we think about as a risk in some ways. You know, sometimes people ask me, uh, you know, is it, is it fair trade certified? Is it non-GMO certified? Is it organic certified? And uh, the acai that we work with right now is actually organic certified. I'm not 100% sure how that happens, <laughs> um, but, uh, but it is USDA certified. But it's not fair trade or, um, or non-GMO or some of those other fancier certifications because the government hasn't made it out that far. And, uh, and in a way, I'm kind of okay with that. You know, like it's, uh, to me, it's even a little bit weird that it is USDA certified because – I'm I'm okay with trusting Mother Nature, and I you know I get not everyone shares that, but having having been out there, it's a it's a sight to see. So I'm not I'm not too not too worried about that aspect of it. But on the other hand, you do have to worry as the as the market grows. There's always someone who's willing to come in and say, okay, well I'll take the you know ten cents per pound 
of low quality farmed acai instead of the, the dollar per pound or you know whatever I don't know the exact price difference I'm just shoot, making up numbers there but um they'll take that that you know higher price and 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 boost production but that's where it's so important to keep control in the hands of the of the local community who already know how to balance the uh, the need to survive and harvest against the need to look to the future. These people have been doing that for hundreds of years, and that's why we want to build up an infrastructure that empowers them now. And it also is a really good time to highlight the fact that that is a higher quality product, and that because Absolutely. it's naturally grown, it isn't just that you're supporting these communities, which is very admirable and it's great to do, but this is also a better quality product, which is so often overlooked in the social entrepreneur space of that importance of having a good product. Absolutely. And with that, I do want to talk a little bit about your guys' product because I have mm -hmm. it sitting here in front of me and I've gotten to awesome. enjoy it, which was an amazing experience and I want to thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. So you've described this once to me as fruit leather. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through that? Sure. So fruit leather is the generic term for fruit that is pureed or blended in some way. You can do it from just fruit juice, but usually you'll do it from whole fruits and then dried generally pretty slowly over time. Obviously, you know, fruit roll-ups are, you know, spray dried out at some crazy process, but true fruit leather is slow dried in a low temperature oven uh, from whole blended fruits. And that's exactly what we do. So our, our fruit strips, our fruit leather is, uh, it's Acai is the main ingredient, and then we have a couple different flavors. We have an apple flavor and a pineapple flavor, and that's pretty much all the ingredients in both of them. They uh, each have a little bit of pear, just to because uh, it's a great uh, natural blend blender to help kind of meld the flavors. The apple has a little bit of lemon juice just to bring out the um, bring out the appleiness a little bit. But that's it. It's just 100% fruit. All the fruits are organic, as we talked about, as we uh, were kind of mentioning before, and uh, we don't add anything else. So no sugar, no preservatives. No, nothing but those, just those fruits that I listed off. Now you guys know my secret recipe. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> but you got to have a lot of patience to let them dry properly, right? You, you do. And that's actually where, the, uh, where the, um, the, the true secret recipe comes in. Acai is very difficult to work with um, because of the way the fruit is, uh, is made. Um, the, way, the way the fruit puree is made, um, it's very tough to, uh, to dry uh, properly and get a good flavor and, and, uh, you know, while maintaining the nutrition and the texture. And that's what took us about six months of R and D to really figure out. So it's, it's not the, uh, you know, the, the fruits in there, it's the, the proportions and how you dry it to get a really consistent, delicious product. That's the, the tough part. So now where is all this process happening? Well, uh, it started off in my mom's kitchen here in Akron, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. Some of the best ones do, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely. Yep, yeah. Me, me and uh, me and um, you know, the Microsoft boys, right? Um, but uh, we'll see. But no, so we, yeah, I started as an experiment in my uh, in my parents' kitchen. It was actually my dad's idea to try to make fruit leather out of acai because I knew I wanted to do something with acai. But I was kind of looking at different types of products, and that was, you know, we realized that there were a couple of fruit of fruit snacks that had a little bit of acai in them, but mostly it was just a gimmick where it was you know, a tiny little bit of it. And usually there were a thousand gross things mixed in. So we're like, why don't we do it as the main ingredient? And then after six months of figuring out how to do that, I realize now why no one else had done it because <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Job security right there. Yeah, absolutely. And then we quickly moved, once I kind of got the process down quickly, you know, six months, um, we moved to a food incubator here in Cleveland. Um, Cleveland is actually a pretty good space in the foodie scene, oddly enough. Um, and so there's a great organization called the Cleveland Culinary Launch Kitchen, and uh, it's exactly designed for food startups like me to uh, come in and use a commercial kitchen where it has all the equipment, all the certifications, and then you know training to make sure that you're following all the rules uh, to uh, to help you launch a product that is safe and legal and can very quickly become shelf ready. And so we worked with them for about another six months, and then. Uh, moved to a, a second small facility when we started to outgrow them. And then we actually launched a, uh, a larger production partnership um, in August, at the end of August of last year. And that's really exciting because one of the things that I've realized, and we talked about this a little bit more, 
in that that previous interview that you mentioned the uh, the journey to social entrepreneurship uh, series. But um, just to touch on it here, I, you know, you realize that I don't want just the the sourcing of my product to be in keeping with my my goal for community economic empowerment. I also want the other steps to be as much as possible following that philosophy. And so when we started to look for a production partner, it was very important to us to find someone that met our values um, and really incorporated that into their own practices. And that's why we're super proud to be working with um, two different organizations that do vocational therapy for folks with developmental disabilities here in the Akron and Cleveland area. And uh, that's where we do our, our, um, our production and our packaging is all done by t uh, team members with developmental disabilities that are going through these vocational therapy programs. And then we uh, provide a full wage job for the folks that are, that are coming through the, pro the program to help us make the snacks. And I have to admit, I'm really excited because on Friday, I'm going to be connecting with one of the gentlemen who you've been working with. Him and his mom are going to talk to us about what kind of impact that vocational training has made in their lives. So yeah, that was a great that was a great example of um, of really going going back to our earlier conversation, the uh, sort of the, the service journey that uh, can take you interesting places. Um, I met I met that 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 fellow. Um, Andy, or, or I call him AJ sometimes, and his mom, Peg, uh, I met them at a farmer's market about a mile from my house where I was just there being uh, pretty much the same Peace Corps volunteer that I always was, just like, here, I've got some snacks. I'm you know, just trying to figure it out. Can I just ask a bunch of random people, just walk up to them and be like, hey, would you mind trying this uh, toothpick full of fruit leather and tell me what you think? Um, so I was kind of wandering around a CSA of a farmer's market. I mean, I, I had a table, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, and, and Andy and his mom just, uh, particularly Andy got super excited about it. You know, they thought it was delicious and they loved the story. Um, you know, his mom had, had lived in South America or Central America at one point. So and Andy was super excited when they were leaving, his mom pulled me aside and, you know, just gave me their, uh, their phone number and said, you know, Hey, a AJ, you know, obviously it has some, uh, some developmental, uh, needs. He, he has a uh, down syndrome, but, uh, he is a great great stickerer. He loves sticking stickers and he's done it, you know, for a couple of other organizations. So once you get the, uh, the formula nailed down and you're ready to uh, package it, give us a call and we'd love to help you put the labels on. And about six months later, I called him up and, and, you know, they remembered who I was and we're still super excited about it. And so, uh, we sat down around a, a kitchen table and, and, uh, started sticking some labels and he uh, is still on the team that, uh, that, that is helping us through those uh, organizations. It's actually give credit where credit is due. His mom is actually the one who, um, Peg Haas, she's the one who, who pointed me towards the uh, towards that, that opportunity to work with th those organizations on a larger scale. So it's really thanks to her that we've, uh, we've been able to scale up so successfully. That story resonates with me so personally just because I have a cousin with Down syndrome who is just the most delightful, joyous person to be around and she loves attention. And so I could only imagine how exciting it is to have that work that you go forward to each day that you're just, it's very fulfilling. Um, it is. And it really I is. know if she had a job like that, she would just love it and everyone loves her. So <laughs> it'd be a fun work environment actually. Yeah. Well, Evan, I'm just totally blown away on all the different ways that your company makes an impact. You're creating healthy food for the consumer. You're personally knowing where the food is sourced from and going for that higher grade of organic, healthy acai. And then on top of that, in your supply chain, you're focusing on vocational training for kids with development disabilities. This is a really amazing company that you've put together. Uh, well, I, I appreciate you saying so. we got to be a... Uh... We got to be profitable and sustainable before I'll be quite willing to admit that. But I'm excited about the prospects. I will say that much. Well, if it makes you feel better, in Journey to Social Entrepreneurship, my interview with Neil from Three Twins Ice Cream, which is a nationally recognized brand, he did comment that they're not quite yet profitable. So wow. I think the food battle takes a little while. It does. Yeah, we gotta. We're, we're definitely getting that stage now where we're starting to to uh, look for outside funding. So far. We've been uh, bootstrap, as it's called, and uh, that is getting tough. So we're, we're just uh, starting to try to figure out that process of how to get money. Well, with that impact that you guys have and making sure you have a great product, I'm sure there's great things on the horizon. But with this year specifically, what do you see happening for Peaceful Fruits? 
Well, we uh, so it's it's 2016. We're just getting off to a good start, and uh, one of the big things on the horizon is that we've been accepted into Whole Foods. So we're very excited that we should be on uh, at least a few Whole Foods shelves uh, shortly, and then as we do well there. I won't say if, I'll say as we do well there, we'll uh, we'll be expanding out to more and more of those. So that's a very exciting opportunity, again, because they're obviously a great place for natural foods and their social values also echo a lot of the things that we're about. So we're ex- very excited for that partnership. The other awesome thing that we are really looking forward to comes up in May. Um, we were accepted into a social enterprise um, uh, ex- business accelerator uh, this, this past uh, in November. And that will culminate in May, which has a chance for us to win uh, $25,000. And then we also get to pitch uh, the Peaceful Fruits business in front of a a room full of investors here in Cleveland. So we're very excited about the the prospects of uh, getting some of that cash that we need to keep growing. And that's what we're focused on. We're focused on growing, on scaling up, and uh, just keep pushing the impact and, and slinging the snacks. Well, I think you guys have a big 2016, and it also, oddly enough, mirrors a lot of the initial success points from Cooley Cooley, which just recently, in Journey to Social Entrepreneurship, their founder announced that Whole Foods, their partnership with them, they were now in every single store nationwide. So looking forward to seeing that with Peaceful Fruits, and hopefully down here in Southern California, we can have your guys' have easier access to your snacks as well. Absolutely. We are in a couple of uh, of small stores around there. So you'll have to, I don't know exactly where you live, but let me know and I can maybe point some out. Uh, looking forward to that. And we'll also have to have on the website a list of different places that people can find your snacks. That'd be great. With that, I think we're ready for some rapid fire. I'm ready. Your game? Let's do this. Always. The rapid fire is one of my all-time favorite parts of this show, and I think it's just because of those adventures we get to talk about, like shark diving. How many guests have we had that have gone shark diving? Absolutely incredible. But before we dive into that, I wanted to share a quick insight from this incredible event called Journey to Social Entrepreneurship, which was all about focusing in and channeling the power of service to fuel powerful social enterprises. So that insight was all about asking permission. Sometimes we wait too long to act, almost waiting for the world to give us the okay. K Tekka founder describes a pivotal moment in his journey where he could either move forward or ask permission. If you're at a point in your life where you're ready to activate and you're ready to move forward, then this event is for you. Unlock all 20 recordings at journey to social entrepreneurship.com slash live. That includes some incredible founders like Three Twins Ice Cream, Cooley Cooley, Sponsor Change, My Ed Match, and more. And with that, I think we're ready for a dose of adventure. Life is a balance of work, passion, and adventure. Can you tell us about a recent adventure or excursion you've gone on? So to, to me, uh, a lot of my excursions are still uh, roped into the business. But uh, they're still super exciting. So one of the great things that we got to do recently was I did a sampling demo at the Cleveland Clinic um, where we, we do have our snacks for sale there at the Cleveland Clinic, obviously a, a great uh, world-renowned hospital. And let me tell you, it's pretty fun sampling at a place like that where you'll have you know brain surgeons walk through that just like desperate for a snack, nurses that, you know, same thing, just tr- going a mile a minute. And then you'll have someone come through, you know, at – half a mile an hour dragging their IV uh, on a thing just like and wanting to hear your life story because, you know, they're stuck in the hospital for a couple of weeks. So it was just a great mix of people, an awesome day, uh, handing out snacks and making a lot of, uh, of new friends down at the Cleveland Clinic. So that was a lot of fun recently. Definitely a very different yet very valuable adventure. Absolutely. Many social entrepreneurs find solace and tranquility in the outdoors. Have you found this to be true and beneficial in your work? Uh... Yeah, I like the outdoors, but I have to say um, I'm pretty jaded on that having lived in the Amazon for two years. Um, So for me, I'm actually more the opposite. I tend to recharge um, in uh, chaotic, loud, uh, um, dynamic surroundings. I actually uh, I I do martial arts almost every day. I both teach and and train uh, six or seven days a week. And so being in the middle of a, you know, either teaching a class of five-year-olds or 55-year-olds, what it might be, just running around, 
uh, that that really gets me pumped up. Or same thing, working you know by myself with other uh, adults at my own level, kicking and punching and and jumping up and down, it, it gets me going. Can I just say that I want to be the fifty five year old or even like older who's taking a martial arts class? How cool is that? Oh, it's it's awesome. I've had uh, a seventy three year old legally blind student. I've had three year olds and everything in between. So it's uh, it's for everybody. It really is. Can you describe a time when you were able to have boots on the ground and really see the impact of your work in action? I think, uh, well, you'll get some of this from, from AJ later in the week, it sounds like, but I remember a couple of times when I've gone into uh, Blick Clinic is one of our partners that, that also does the packaging. And uh, it's it's almost embarrassing to say, but when, when I walk into their um, their clinic, they treat me like a rock star. I mean, it's it, it blows my mind in that like heartwarming, choked up kind of way where you walk in and there's like, oh, you're Evan. Like it's your it, you're the, you're peaceful fruits. You're the labels that we're sticking. This is great. And they're so excited to not just be, um, you know, not just having something to do, but like, you know, we pay them and they love the snacks for one thing. And then they love the mission. You know, they're all super excited to hear about the rainforest. They always, you know, ask me about what snakes I've seen and things like that. And so I remember, you know, walking in and seeing that table full of folks, um, just this, you know, slapping the, those labels on and just so excited to be part of, to be part of Peaceful Fruits. It really, really blew my, blew, blew my heart away. Oh, that really, especially with my cousin Katie, it really is so powerful to me to hear those stories because it is, it's a lot of jubilation and especially Katie is the most excitable, friendly, thankful person and oh, gives me it, chills. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's really, that, that's part of one of my long-term goals, you know, my, my vision for Peaceful Fruits, if you will, is that uh, when, I, when I've had this partnership and then now when I talk to other food entrepreneurs, I'm, you know, they've converted me. I'm, I'm 100% an advocate where I hear my, my fellow entrepreneurs, you know, at the Cleveland Culinary Launch Kitchen, for example, they're moaning about, you know, okay, I made all these snacks. Or I mean, you know, not, they don't make snacks. I made all this food and I put it in all the jars. Now I have to label all those, you know, darn jars. And I'm like, why? You don't have to. Like, I know a group of people that would love to help you out with that and make their day and make your life easier. So there's, there, I really want to help more and more businesses, whether they're officially a social enterprise like me or not, think about those opportunities that can really m make a difference in people's lives. And it's, I mean, let's be honest, it's a great selling point. It touches people as it should. Oh, so powerful. The journey of social entrepreneurship is such a roller coaster where we have these really <laughs> high moments and, you know, there's also a lot of other moments. Along that journey, what has been your favorite mistake? That's a great question. Uh, favorite mistake? I don't know. Uh, lots of unfavorites. But um, so I, I think uh, one, of the, one of the hardest things has been knowing when or try, trying to see when you're outrunning the bear, to use an old phrase. You know you know the one I'm talking about? You don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun your friend. Uh, uh, which I is lived in Montana for several years. When we oh, went hiking, so we would use that quite often. I, I bet you did. Um, so uh, that's something that's very important as a social entrepreneur. Um, and, you know, we talk, talk, talked about this a little bit. You know, my background is in boring operations management stuff. But even so... Uh, it's easy to get swept up in the impact, swept up in the, the, the working with the people on the ground, making a difference. Um, and so one of the mistakes that we still make sometimes is getting too excited about that and not sticking to the fundamentals of the business and of the product. And so, for example, what I'm thinking of very specifically is I remember I went to the uh, Cleveland Fabulous Food Show, which is, you know, a giant – uh, you know, million square foot exo expo with thousands of people walking around trying different foods. And so it was a three day event. I was there. And I think the first day I, uh, you know, people tried my product, but almost no one bought it. And people, not, not very many people wanted to try it. And it's because I was talking to them about saving the Amazon and helping people with developmental disabilities and compostable packaging. And that stuff is all awesome to me, to me and to you and to them as well. But they were there to try food, <laughs> and so you can't lose sight of that of that core of what people are engaging with. You know that vehicle that helps you get to that impact is important, and so that was definitely a mistake of you know having to craft my pitch to bring people in, 
rather than hitting them over the head with this is you know this is saving the world stuff like you got to want to eat it first or it's not going to save anything so <laughs> that's definitely something we're still still uh figuring out how to apply that lesson as best we can further driving home the point that no matter how great your cause is you really have to have a good product you do absolutely what book do you recommend to others who want to make a socially minded impact through their work um let's see that is a good question um honestly uh, if you want a specific book, um, I would actually recommend Honest Tea, uh, which is a great um, company that uh, obviously started a, a, a tea um, company, but they're very socially minded. It's a, it's done in the form of a comic, so it's a great um, almost step by step guide of a social, a socially minded food startup becoming a, a multi million dollar company. But I would actually step back and I, I would say it's easy to find advice like that. I think what's more important um, is just reading books that broaden your mind, just getting, getting you know, th things that, that are creative and exciting and just make you think about different ways to look at the world, whether that's, you know, uh, a, a sci-fi sci cheap novel or, uh, you know, a copy of, the, of, of, you know, Martin Luther King's biography or wh whatever it might be, just something that totally changes the way you look at the world. That's what social entrepreneurs do. Is change the way that people interact with the normal world. So there's pl plenty of plenty of guidebooks and step by steps and you know of varying degrees. And honesty that their book is a, is a good example of that. But really, just get out there and broaden your mind. Oh, absolutely incredible! Looking forward to uh, adding some sci-fi books to my list. Actually, <laughs> there you go. Is there a mantra or a motto that guides forward your work with Peaceful Fruits? Uh, there is, um, and coming up with taglines for a business is surprisingly hard actually we, so you we have mentioned a lot, you... that we covered that one in our journey to social entrepreneurs that's right that. <laughs> we did yeah yeah exactly um, and uh to so... all our listeners who haven't heard that you really need to go listen because some of your <laughs> names i mean like no offense some of your names it's good you had somebody to bounce those off with because they were pretty they're pretty rough well you know, hey, it's a, it's a it's an iter iterative process, you know, but um, but that's okay. But uh, so one of our early um, attempts at a, a slogan or a tagline, as you will, um, that we don't really emphasize on our packaging anymore, still really resonates with us when we're making business business decisions, and that is we want to produce a snack that people can enjoy with peace of mind, and there's. Uh, a couple of you know key words in it, like you know enjoy is a big one because we don't want people to have to make sacrifices to do what's right we want to make it easy for people to do the right thing and in this case the right thing is support amazon conservation economic empowerment for the people there in the amazon economic empowerment for those folks with developmental disabilities around here and then even you know like our sustainable packaging let's make it easy for people to make that right decision because it tastes just as good it's in the same store and it doesn't cost 10 times as much. So let's make so that enjoy piece is, is important. And that goes back to the balance that you and I were just talking about in terms of lessons learned. But then also looking at that they can enjoy with peace of mind. That peace of mind is really important because I want people to know that this is a product that's, you know, it's healthy. It's not just and then it's also it's good for you. And then it's it's good for the world. You know, it's it's made the right way from the right stuff. So you don't have to worry about what junk you're putting in. Or you know who, who's being enslaved somewhere to, to make it. It's it's supporting everyone at each step of the chain, and so you can just relax and know that you're doing something good for yourself and, and good for the world, and enjoy it. Such an incredible summary, and really, really driving home how peaceful fruits and just all the components are so built into not only your messages, but your brand ethos. Evan, absolutely incredible. My last question for you today is how, what advice do you give to our listeners to make a positive impact in their life today? I think you have to get outside of your normal life. You know, a lot of people um, think that they have to do something big and dramatic to make a difference, and that is so far from the truth. And this is coming from someone who obviously did something big and dramatic, right? So I don't know. I'm not, not throwing any stones by any, uh, by any stretch. But one of the things that I, that I did before I, got, I, I joined Peace Corps is I started doing a GED tutoring. And it was uh, an hour a week or even every other week, I think, with uh, you know people that are obviously 
have dealt with some obstacles and some struggles in their life and are trying to get life back on track in many cases, not, not always, but, um, and you've never met a more, uh, you know, exciting and, and engage room full of people that are just want to learn. And it doesn't take any special skills. doesn't take any preparation. You just show up once, you know, an hour for every other week and you're making a huge difference in people's lives. And there are lots of little opportunities like that, that, uh, you can really feel good about what you're doing and get really feel empowered by it without having to, to move to the rainforest like, you know, like, like some of us did. But uh, that's okay. There's lots of ways to just take a second step back and say, what can I do right now that's, that's easy, it's simple, but it'll still make a huge impact. And, and so something tutoring like that or finding a way to you know, just pick up a couple extra pieces of trash when you're, when you're going somewhere, there's always little things you can do that really will, will help your day have a boost and then help everyone around you. Really powerful tactical advice. Although I have to admit, you know, moving to the rainforest may or may not be on my list for some day. But Evan, it has been such a pleasure. How do people learn and find out more about this incredible fruit snacks that you have? So the easiest thing is uh, www.peacefulfruits.com. Uh, we're just right there on the internets. And then, of course, we are on Twitter at Peaceful Fruits and on Facebook as well for with the same thing, you know, Facebook slash Peaceful Fruits. Uh, so, yeah, check us out, follow us, like us, whatever, and uh, be, be tuned in for the continuing story. Hopefully we'll have uh, a good a good growth and some great some great stuff going on just like Cooley Cooley does. They're definitely a company that I always watch and get inspiration from. So we're hoping to follow in their footsteps. And with that Whole Foods partnership, you definitely are on the right path. Evan, Hope so. this has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it as well. Great to have the chance to talk further. Well, movers and shakers, I hope you guys enjoyed that deep dive into the world of peaceful fruits and how these simple fruit leather snacks are really making a huge impact. I currently even have about five of them on my kitchen table and I have to tell you guys, the experience of getting them is pretty cool, even down to the fact that the bags are compostable. For all those photos, resources mentioned, and to get a list of different places that you can get them in your area, head on over to our show notes page at positiveimpactpodcast.com slash peacefulfruits. I absolutely loved how Evan really emphasized the importance of being a reader, and it's something all of our guests share. So if you're looking to be a reader but don't necessarily want to sit down with a traditional book, then for you guys, we have two free audio downloads thanks to Audible. Head on over to that show notes page or anywhere on our website and you can get those two books. While I don't think a graphic novel like Honesty will be the best recommendation for an audio book, we have different recommendations from all of our guests. And as usual, join us back on Friday as we connect with Peg and AJ to really see how this job of labeling peaceful fruits is making a positive impact. Until next time, keep doing your part to make the world a better place.